So, hello everybody. I am Sunita Chandrasekharan from University of Delaware. Um, this is a work that was done with, that, that's been done over the past several years with folks, students and Dr. Chaplin when we were at the University of Houston um, as, a, as an HPC tools group. So if you look at the acknowledgement list, it's a laundry list. We have uh, Peng Sun who's right here, he's with AMD. Uh, he graduated from UH as a PhD um, student. So then Su Yang is a master, was a master's student at U of H and he's at Microsoft. Sheng Wang graduated with a PhD, he's at Microsoft. Dr. Chapman moved to Stony Brook. Tobias and Marcus are from Siemens, Germany. So it's a collaborative work, as you can see. And uh, there's also work came out of Semiconductor Research Corporation. Um, okay, so let's dive into the talk. So this is something that is concentrating on embedded systems. Like how do we need, you know, why do we need, need high level abstraction or programming models for embedded systems? So that's the key message here. So to start with heterogeneous embedded systems, we have, you know, many number of devices. It just, it's not just CPU plus GPU. We have you know, ARM plus DSP. We have CPU plus FPGA, the recent Intel um, Altera machine. Then we have ARM plus GPU, which is the NVIDIA's Tegra TX1. So all these count as heterogeneous systems, right? So we are not just looking at homogeneous systems. We're looking at heter heterogeneous systems, systems of different types. So that's a Qualcomm Snapdragon. This is a Tegra TX1 with four ARM cores and a <clears throat> GPU core. So systems are getting complicated, right? We are having devices of different types. Um, so programming multi-core embedded systems has been a challenge. It's continuing to be a challenge, although you know, many, uh, many in intricate details are being ironed out with the different programming models uh, kind of existing. But on a, on a broad level, heterogeneous systems are presenting complexity both at the silicon and at the system level. And uh, standards and tool chain are more and more proprietary, as in we have different vendors having their own proprietary tool chains, uh, or we have really low level, you know, intrinsic kind of languages, which, you know, which is again a problem with embedded uh, programming and embedded system. We have portability, scalability issues. Portability meaning you really cannot use a tool chain, which is proprietary, proprietary on one target platform, on another target platform, even belonging to the same family. So that's also a challenge. Scalability issues, sometimes a, you know, a small core is two, two core platform and there is another, core, another platform with four cores, eight cores, so on and so forth. So there are scalability issues as well. And TTM is a very important concept in embedded system where with, 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 not, with not real abstractions or not a neat programming model, the time to market is becoming more and it's la becoming large, which is not good because you know you want the like iPhone and you know Samsung on Android phones and stuff, you want it to go to the market really quickly for which you need the software tool chain to be efficient and you cannot afford to have a longer time to you know, create that tool chain. So bottom line is we need industry standards. We need standards that can, um, you know, like OpenMP, which is industry standard, put together by different, uh, different academia, universities, vendors, right? Uh, so we need something like that to offer portable, scalable software solutions so that we're able to target more than just one platform, which should be the key um, idea for a given programming model. So looking at the current set of you know, state-of-the-art solutions for heterogeneous embedded systems, we are seeing different types of solutions. And among those, OpenCL has been pretty neat in terms of being able to target different platforms. So they, are, they have a variety of target platforms that they can really target. Most of the other state-of-the-art solutions are either too high level, uh, sorry, too heavyweight for embedded platforms where you have really scarce resources. We are not talking about 1,000 cores. We are not talking about, you know, a Titan supercomputer where you have n number of GPUs. We are talking about four cores, one GPU, eight cores, ten, uh, four DSP. So it's relatively a small platform. And uh, most of the models, programming models, seem to require support from operating system and compilers, but some devices do not have an OS. They are bare metal. For example, one of the research that we did was a specialized accelerator from Freescale, which was a bare metal ac specialized accelerator platform. So it had no OS. So you have to dive into the hardware directly from the software stack. And uh, some of the solutions seem to be very restricted to environment of, uh, you know, or course of single type, homogeneous environment. So it's becoming difficult to improve the model to support heterogeneous systems. So what do we really need, right? That's a fundamental question. So something that is not too low level, that requires steep learning curve. So the idea of, you know, porting becomes a challenge. You are spending more time in learning the tool chain 
and not spending enough time on the algorithm itself. So we want something that is lightweight because, like I said, embedded systems have really scarce resources. Something that can target heterogeneous embedded platforms, and I insisted that this, when I say heterogeneous, it's beyond CPU, GPU. We have to think about a variety of platforms. And TTM, time to market, is key when you come to embedded uh, devices. And last but not the least, like I said, we need industry standards. So for this particular work, we have used OpenMP and another industry standard called Multicore Association, in short MCA APIs, which is pr primarily designed for embedded systems. It's low, it's, it's low level, it's lightweight, but it's catering to scarce resources, which is the main thing in embedded, uh, embedded systems. So we are going to look into both models, and we are going to look into what could we do with both industry standards and create a software stack and be able to target the list of you know, embedded platforms we have. So that's the work that we were doing. So that might look quite familiar, which is a simple implementation of you know, uh, how an OpenMP code really looks like. You take, a, you take a piece of code, you insert directives into the code, depending on the kind of directives you want, your, uh, you want your, in your code. And then you have the compiler transformation, and then you have the li runtime library, which is key to schedule um, load across a different course, different um, platform architectures. And you have synchronization going on when you have different threads, you know, trying to um, throw tasks on different cores, and you want the threads to come together, draw a synchronization point. Um, and this was important to note because each compiler has customized runtime support. Quality of the runtime system has major impact on performance. So every runtime has its own, um, every tool has its own runtime uh, support. So that's a small gist of you know, what really happens under the hood with a given an OpenMP implementation. So this is a slide that I borrowed from um, the OpenMP uh, ARB, of course, which, is a, which shows kind of history of OpenMP. The key thing to look here is it started off in 1997 and look at where we are, right? We are in 2016 and uh, we are, the question mark here, which says 5.0, which was what was mentioned in the OpenMP buff yesterday, released in 2018. But it started off as a small group and then it expanded and we are in multiple members right now, different vendors, different universities. 30, right? 29, 30, yeah. So it's grown and it's still growing, which is fascinating. And the amount of features that has been added to the standard, it's, it's continuously improving depending on the application needs, depending on user needs, and you know how things are really implemented under, under the hood. Um, so that's a chart with the different graphics in there. So that's a short gist of what OpenMP is. Now moving on to multi-core association, this is also an industry standard, which is reduced to reduce complexity involved in writing software for multi-core chips. So that's the key idea of this multi-core association industry standard. Um, they have a set of APIs for communication, for resource management, for task management. Um, so communication APIs is communicating between cores of different types belonging to this, you know, a single board. For example, you have CPUs, GPUs, and you're trying to communicate between those two different types of uh, devices. And you have resources, you're trying to uh, target, say I have four cores, so I need to choose, say, three, three, three cores to keep it busy. There is another core that is idle, so you're trying to really pin down the resources you want to use. This work focuses on task management, whose philosophy is very similar to OpenMP tasks. Um, it's just that it's meant to be lighter weight, catering to embedded systems. You, you, have, you have the literal concepts of you know, what you really do with tasks. So decompose an application, a bunch of tasks, you schedule them you prioritize them and all sorts of things. So that's a graphic of uh, the task management API, which is what this work particularly focuses. So it's a standardized API for task parallel programming on a wide range of hardware architectures and developed and driven by several you know, marketing, market leading companies. So MRAPI, CAPI, SHIM, and Open, OpenAMP. So these are the, this is a gist of the members that have contributed to MTAPI, but MCA itself has you know, many other members if you go take a look at the site. So we have tasks and we have a Q API concept and this picture denotes that it's an API created to manage systems that can have shared memory, distributed memory, and different instruction set architectures, even bare metal, so on and so forth. So what did we want to do, right? We learned MCA, Multicore Association APIs, we learned OpenMP, we know both of them are industry standards and we have this cool, powerful embedded system board sitting in front of us. So how do you really program that? So the idea we came up with is, hey, so why don't we create a translation between OpenMP and MCA 
in the sense that we use MCA as the layer just above the hardware and we abstract it even further above with the OpenMP layer on top because we want to keep programming simple. So the idea here was start off with a parallel, you have an application, you program an OpenMP, the programmer doesn't need to worry about the gory details of what's happening under the hood while the translation takes care of, which is the OpenMP to MCA translation. And then you have you know, an architecture with different types of OSS, for example, we have not really tested on each of this, but the fundamental concept of this API is to be able to target operating system, different operating systems and even bare metal. And then finally you have the heterogeneous system as your underlying hardware. So that was the um, principle of this entire work. So what did we do? So this is a concept of MTAPI where the idea is like, just like we have OpenMP tasks, in MTAPI it is considered to be jobs. This is different vocabulary here, but conceptually it is it's similar. And these jobs, every job can be associated with different actions. Now you can have an action that is going into CPU, you can have another action that goes to GPU, you have another action that goes to DSP. Um, so that's the uh, essence of you know, a task management API. And you have different applications and stuff. So this particular picture is borrowed from Siemens, with whom we worked with on this project, Siemens Germany, where they have plugins for CUDA and OpenCL, where the idea is to trans be able to use OpenCL from MTAPI, be able to use CUDA plugin from MTAPI. So you have an OpenMP, and it's actually there's different translation layers under, until you reach the hardware. And there is, of course, scheduling going on. So the MTAPI implementations right now, we have two open source implementations. One is the EMB square, which is quite popular. Uh, embedded multi-core building blocks, EMB square open source library. This is um, maintained by MCA, Marcus Levi, who has been maintaining it, and Siemens contributes, and I think several other companies contribute to it. Um, and another implementation that we came up with is, most of the work is done at the University of Houston, then I moved to University of Delaware, so we had both logos up there. Um, so it's basically two open source implementations, there is GitHub links here. This paper is also published at the Rome workshop uh, co-located with Europar. So there's a proceedings if you want to go look at the, um, the work more in detail and look at the GitHub as well. Um, so we had our implementation and then we were constant dialogue with Siemens Germany. We were like, okay, so you have your open source, we have our open source, let's talk. So it is not a competitive effort, but it's more like you have your you know, implementations targeting platforms, I have my implementations targeting my set of platforms. So let's find the common ground and let's build this open source architecture. And you know, because both our focus is targeting embedded platforms. So that was the idea behind um, working with Siemens and they were awesome collaborators. So we wrote a paper together and put the work on uh, GitHub and everything. Um, so that's a picture on scheduling. This is an artwork that Siemens did, which we have borrowed for this talk where you have those, the literal scheduling mechanism. For example, you have those different jobs or tasks in MTAPI language, and you have a scheduler that is going to define where the jobs will be scheduled. Is it CPU friendly? Is it GPU friendly? Is it DSP friendly? And then you also have Q APIs, which is going to, use, which is going to do the usual um, job of what a queue really does. Right? You, you allocate all, you um, queue all the tasks, and there's a local queue, there is a global queue, and all those kind of concepts. There is a work ceiling scheduling concept. Um, so the reason for the main reason for this kind of uh, scheduling mechanism is you have a variety of platforms. You're talking about type cores of different types. So how do you really channel your work to these cores of different types? Um, and the UH MTAPI implementation went a step forward, um, trying to give us kind of come up with a scheduling implementation for internode communication as well. Siemens did an intra-node communication, so they had, they were doing very good in the intra-node. We had that extra stretch doing an inter-node with tasks, so that was another reason why the, both the work came together pretty well. So this is a list of, um, it's not entirely a list though, yeah, kind of it is. So obviously the first target platform is x86, but beyond that we targeted an NVIDIA Jetson TK1, which has got the uh, quad-core ARM processor and a Kepler GPU. Uh, with all its Jetson um, toolkit. And uh, the preliminary work for, was done on a power architecture from Freescale and uh, the pattern matching engine, which is a specialized architecture of the power board is the one that was bare metal, no OS. So that's where we tried to um, you know, evaluate our work on a system that had no operating system. 
Um, and a list of benchmark codes that we used were the conventional ones, Rodinia, BOTS, is Barcelona's tasking uh, test codes. And then, um, so that Siemens MTAPI is the implementation. And uh, yeah, we also looked into the GCC OpenMP for evaluation purposes. So that's our test engine. <coughs> the first set of results showcase the evaluation of both the implementations, both UH MTAPI as well as Siemens MTAPI. Um, so we ported this on only ARM cores, ARM plus GPU cores on the Tegra TK1 platform, um, only GPU cores. So we were trying to find out, okay, where does it do the best, you know, under what circumstances. So all those little circles that you see, for example, the blue ones on both the graphs, we have the left one is UH, right one is Siemens, your x-axis is execution time, the uh, y-axis is sizes of matrices, um, the blue mark shows the MTAPI ARM is faster than the MTAPI GPU because of the overhead due to copying of data, which is kind of um, a known issue when you're really moving data around. The red block is the MTAPI GPU, which means the MTAPI action is uh, oriented towards channel towards the GPU cores, which is faster than the MTAPI and ARM GPU for large matrices because of load imbalances. Then um, MTAPI ARM GPU, we optimized the MTAPI ARM GPU implementation, and that was fast because of uh, managing asynchronous transfers and you know, variable block sizes. So there was a lot of playing around with different block sizes, which gave us the, 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 the green result over here, which was, oh, this was actually Siemens optimization. We did not, UH MTAPI did not do this, but Siemens did some more optimizations. They got, they have some more in their um, chart. <clears throat> so this was evaluating the MTAPI implementations. The next step, or I wouldn't call it next step, is both the steps were kind of interleaving each other. So the translation, right? Open MPRTL to MTAPI. So we have used OpenUH for this, and OpenUH intermediate representations have five levels, from high level, very high level to low level. So we looked into the different transformation layers, transform intermediate representations to see which ones can give us really good information to bank on in order to translate to MTAPI function calls and in turn to the MTAPI jobs and actions um, such that we, we leave the scheduling part to the MTAPI layer fun runtime function because the MTAPI is meant to schedule, better schedule on the embedded systems because it is lightweight. So the translation is basically the abstraction is the key and then the MTAPI takes over and does the scheduling. Um, so that's a small graphic there. So if you look at the numbers here, this is a chart that shows OpenMP GCC versus OpenMP MTAPI. The beauty was, even after doing the translation, we did not incur overhead. There was little to negligible overhead, and we tested that using IPCC's benchmarks and several other micro benchmarks. Um, so if you look at the numbers here, the purple one is the GCC, and the OpenMP uh, MTAPI RTL is the smaller boxes with number of threads scaling up and execution time on your y-axis, there are some numbers that this is really looking good, so we, we did dive deeper into it, but we haven't really put our fingers on it as to why exactly this is doing better. Um, I believe it is because the MTAPI scheduling is catered to those scarce resources, and uh, that could be one of the reasons why it is doing even better than the GCC OpenMP. But bottom line is, the OpenMP MTAPI translation is not doing worse than an open source GCC implementation. It did not incur overhead, and we're able to target more than just x86-64. So with this layer, we are able to target multiple platforms, and the amount of time taken is also reduced because nobody is programming in MCA. They're still programming in OpenMP, which is a higher level. So the takeaway and summary of this work was, obviously, industry standards are the way to go. <laughs> I guess we all would agree to that. And uh, OpenMP MCA did not incur, did incur little to no overhead, and we targeted power architecture, specialized architects, accelerators, um, Tegra platform, which is ARM plus GPU, and less learning curve because you need to learn OpenMP. You don't need to learn MTAPI there. And uh, the ability to maintain single code base is another key thing because if you are writing an OpenMP, but you are targeting varying platforms, so things get a lot, lot more easier. So yes, that's what I had. So I'll take questions. It's part of his PhD work, so I believe he won't have questions. <laughs>
the testing was the evaluation platform. Yes. Sure. So the question is, what kind of evaluation platform we use to test this work? We started off with x86 to test our basic implementation in a core, simple CPU cores. The next platform was Freescale Power Architecture. Um, four cores, eight cores, I don't remember. I think eight cores, eight core power architecture from Freescale. And that had this pattern matching engine PME, specialized accelerator, which was bare metal, no OS. That work actually took us six to eight months because we had to figure out what it takes to lower the tool chain to something that doesn't have an OS. Um, and it's an engineering work, so if we publish, it's not nothing novel there, right? So, but out of curiosity, we just went ahead with the work and we did, we did get something running. And the last one was the Tegra TK1, which is the Te NVIDIA's Tegra TK1 platform, which is ARM and a Kepler GPU. This was before TX1 was released, which was last November, so we haven't tested on TX1. Um, yeah, yeah, we haven't tested on a DSP. Yes, yes, yes. Freescale power architecture and the specialized accelerator. Yes. You haven't done heterogeneous yet in practice, right? Well, the ARM plus GPU, a course of different types, I'm defining them as heterogeneous platform. So the PME was the specialized accelerator with power cores, so that becomes a kind of a heterogeneous platform in a course of different types. Um, this, this was fun. This almost like a four and a half, five years work with one master's and two PhDs out of this work. So it's, it was taxing, but I think we had some results to show at the end of it. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the, yeah, I mean, the question is real world application. Where do you really use? <gasps> yes. Right. I think the deep learning and the tasking, like this could be, if I convert this into something like an auto tuning, if you like. Like deep learning is a learning method, right? And then if I use that and come up with a nice model and Just use this M Tappy. Yes. So there's learning and then there is real implementation. So learning is offline and the M Tappy's work is online. So I'm not wasting time processing data. Yes. 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 Bioinformatics. So. Right, right. Plus, I think it's security concern that you go to hospitals, they would like to have something which is in-house. So we are using a TX1 on deep learning. Deep learning TX1 board on an image construction, but not genetics per se. But the idea is exactly security purposes. Keep everything in-house, don't move it away from the building, which I guess the hospitals would really appreciate. So there are various applications that you could base this off of.